It's a great personal uh, pleasure for me to introduce Ken Whisaker, um, a very old and dear friend. Uh, we were just reminiscing uh, yesterday evening that we've seen each other fleetingly over last year, sort of whizzing by each other at meetings like MLA and AAA and barely had a moment to talk. Um, and so uh, it was really good uh, for, uh, to have him agree um, to come and do this talk for us. Uh, Ken Wissaker is the editor-in-chief, editorial director at Duke University Press, uh, where he has worked as an editor for something like the last 20 years. Uh, and he's been um, the uh, editorial director there for as long as I can remember, so I'm not even quite sure how long that is. Um, and uh, as the editorial director, he really has not only shaped a, a terrific set of lists over the time, but really has set the standard both for what um, a really a set of innovative and creative um, lists would be in and across the humanities, and also has repeatedly taken risks in publishing things um, that are experimental and innovative that other presses, our own included, have been uh, more reticent to take on, not least uh, in the face of the current economic environment where books are challenged to turn a profit and those that don't are turned down um, or don't look like they will. So uh, it's uh, terrific in this context to hear um, thinking aloud with us um, a, uh, an editorial director who uh, has con continually set the standard for what publishing in the humanities would be, how we think about publishing in the humanities in the face of challenges like Google and the digitization of books uh, and other um, uh, platforms for publishing and so on. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome him here. He will talk for about half an hour, and then there'll be a discussion for about half an hour. Ken Wissaker. Um, thank you, David, and thanks, Jennifer, and everybody for uh, all the uh, good thoughts and kindnesses and arrangements. I'm very honored. I didn't realize this was the very first meeting, and uh, I have my souvenir program. That I, so it's uh, a lovely thing to be here and well-timed. I'm also uh, somewhat humbled to be here with Mary Morell, who was an excellent editor for many, many years at Princeton. And uh, the work that she talked about this morning has a lot to do with what I'm talking about, except uh, my amateurishness will be uh, apparent uh, uh, with, without any field work, really. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting moment, uh, I think, for humanities publishing and uh, publishing in general. And uh, I've spent a certain amount of time being uh, resistant to change in some ways. And this talk is a part of a kind of thinking where I'm, I managed to move myself past the sort of stuckness, because I would hear talks on digital humanities and always go, this is about databases. This is the work of bibliographers done online. We don't publish stuff like that. We publish books that are arguments, that are interventions into discussions. What's the place of that going to be in an online environment? You know, the, uh, <clears throat> it's very nice to have archives online, and then you can do your work. Uh, but uh, nobody re reads the return of Martin Gare to see if Martin Gare returned. You're not looking for information. You're looking to get a way of thinking. And so this uh, is part of a kind of turn I'm trying to make toward thinking about what might happen to uh, the work of argument in the humanities in a, a digitally oriented age. I've been entertaining some thoughts about the put potential future forms of the book, wondering about the ways that genres of writing and forms of argument will shift in various digital futures. How does the dominance of a particular material form of publication change what counts as a good argument in an academic book? Changes in publishing over recent years have required attention to means of circulation and distribution, but current changes require a different kind of materialism. In what way is the form of an academic argument grounded in the physical form of the book itself? 
I'm used to thinking of form in academic books in terms of, and this was our discussion this morning, a range of ever-changing disciplinary conventions. At a given moment, there are differences in the way a scholar writes a narrative history or makes a philosophical argument or performs a literary analysis of a text. Each type of scholarship implies its own genre, or more accurately, its own set of possible genres of writing. These genres vary within a discipline, and they also change historically. Scholars in the 50s would have been unlikely to make the same arguments about colonial science in India or indigenous Hawaiian masculinities, or even Faulkner, that their successors would make now. Issues that perplex them might seem odd or trivial today. Similarly, we are unlikely to structure the books exploring such topics in the same way. A total ethnography form of the 60s required a different mode of writing than a reflexive one from the 80s or a multi-sided one from a decade ago. Even if a scholar's work is mainstream or doggedly old-fashioned, the conventions change. The genre of the boring but acceptable changes just as much as everything else. Such changes, <laughs> sorry. Such changes work differently in each discipline and subdiscipline. Each has its own set of standards and institutional ways of enforcing them, I mean encouraging them, uh, reproducing, if in slightly changed ways, our sense of the best way of writing in the field. From dissertation requirements, I once heard that film scholars Richard Dyer and Jane Gaines each produced over 900 page dissertations at Northwestern, uh, to hiring committees, journal editorial boards, tenure processes, university and commercial presses, review media, and prizes from scholarly societies. While rarely in perfect accord, these academic institutions work together to say, this makes a good version of Latin American colonial history, this one, not so much. We haven't had a, to pay as much attention to the material form in which the work would be published as a book, at least in relation to style and argument. There was a time when most scholarly books were published in hardcover and intended for libraries and scholars in the particular field. The style and form of books intended to be sold in uh, regular bookstores had to be different. Among those books, there's a difference between those published in cloth or simultaneously in cloth and paper. Different uses and audiences required particular writing styles. If the books were designed to be taught, if they were meant to be read for pleasure by non-academics, and then which ones, music fans, bird watchers, readers of biographies, or popular science readers, or for politics, black history, feminist activists, urban organizers. But by and large, the medium, the bound book remained the same. That's not an assumption that will last long. Think about recorded music. One makes a different record thinking of a 78 player, a car radio, vinyl, CDs, or MP3s. The sound has to be different to flourish in each of the forms. Similarly, a director would make a different film in eight millimeter or 16 millimeter stock. If they were anticipating showing a film at a multiplex or at an installation in a museum, video would be different than digital. We know these things about recorded music and making movies, but we haven't had as much reason to focus on the relationship of materiality and genre when we think about books. Despite the massive changes in the distribution of books in the last decade, the book itself has more or less remained the same. Actually, I'm not sure people thought it was the same the whole time, but now the previous differences seem minor compared to the present transformations. I spend a lot of time teaching people what makes a good academic book. What's the best way to get their ideas across in book form? Trying to be attentive to the disciplinary differences I've mentioned. But the material the structure of the book itself provides common features regardless of discipline. Many of these I don't even think about since they are such second nature. 30 chapters are probably too many. <laughs> 800 pages is more than most of us want to read about a particular Baroque altarpiece or most anything. Chapters should be about the same length. Use paragraphs. <laughs> Have a narrative argument that form, or a narrative or argument, or narrative argument that forms an arc from beginning to end. Use that to establish what is in and what is out. We know that some readers skip around and that some mystery readers skip to the last page 
but we generally urge authors to write assuming that the book will be read straight through from the beginning. We would not want whole sections repeated in the same or different language as if the reader had not read the earlier part of the book. Now what will this advice look like five or ten years from now? Will it still hold or will it change because of all the new ways of reading online, on Kindles or Nooks or whatever comes next? Obviously there will still be disciplinary and theoretical changes, but what if the material form of the printed book is no longer the main form of distribution? How tied to the printed book is the sense that most scholarly books should be between 200 and 400 pages, or really between 240 and 340 pages? <laughs> Publishers prefer lengths that can be taught, that will not make a potential non-specialist reader decide the book is more than they want to know or have time to read. Scholars want their book to be long enough that no one will say it's too short, a kind of weird paranoia. I, I, you never see anyone saying that book is too short, but people are always afraid. <laughs> and short enough that reviewers won't say it needed a good editor, which we like that too. Uh, they also want to say what they feel the material and argument require. If we take seriously the material and cultural forces produce the form, five or ten years from now we may be looking at something very different. But what exactly? Let's look at two equally plausible scenarios. Suppose books are mostly accessed online through academic libraries. At present, I wouldn't write, recommend that you write that 800-page book, since it will not be taught and will be expensive to bind and produce. But if we anticipate that the books will be mostly found and read online as part of a search through a pool of material held by a library or in Google, the 800-page book might be ideal. More searchable items, more hits, Take all the space you need. It's a big cloud out there. On the other hand, it's just as likely to assume that books are going to be generally read front to back as they are now, but on a handheld device. If that device is a tablet and the reader is constantly tempted to check Twitter or Facebook, 300 pages may be two or three times too long. If an author wants to hold the reader's attention, there may not be enough time to explain what Judith Butler meant by precarity the reader's precarious attention may suddenly be elsewhere. <laughs> how would we make a given argument, how we would make a given argument would change substantially if we were trying to stage that argument over 100 pages or 1,100 pages. Different things would count as well-argued or well-told. That's what I mean that the genre is tied to the form. This is a familiar story in the history of the book, one reason that most of Dickens' novels are so long is that they were written for serial publication. That's how he supported himself. The object was to make them pay for as long as they could. That's a different way of telling a story. To take this step one step further, what about academic forms of the future that will be even less like current books than these examples? The Born Digital Electronic Project that aspires to do what an academic book does make an argument, or present the complexity of a set of events in an entirely different way. Something longer than a journal article, as we might see in vectors, but not exactly a book either. I don't mean a database or an archive, but an academic argument made in digital form. Such a publication might be single authored, or co-written, or produced out of a lab. Reasonably, the desire to produce and quite quickly, the desire to be recognized for tenure or promotion <laughs> for producing such projects is strong. But at present, we have almost no sense of what the genre will look like, the sense of how much is enough, what makes one successful and the other less so. Not to be Joe Aristotle, but what's the best way to bring a reader in? Is there a close? How do we you make sure the reader gets the main point? In many ways, we have no idea. Scholars might agree about some desired features, but there is nothing yet that could settle into a set of genre conventions where we could say, this is the way it should be done. That's a good thing, since it means more open experimentation, but it's a limitation, too. A few years ago, my partner Kathy Davidson was teaching a graduate class, and she had the students read the opening sentences from a range of articles that had been published in the journal American Literature, which she was editing at the time. She didn't identify the authors or the date of publication and chose pieces for authored by famous and unknown scholars from different decades. The class read the first three sentences and compared them. Remarkably, the exact same things happened in all the openings, 
no matter how forward-thinking or old-school the article. We are very far from that sense of genre. Oh, I recognize that, or I recognize that so much I don't even notice it, for born digital forms. What is most difficult about the current moment is also its possibility. Even sticking to the book, it's equally plausible that five or 10 years from now, they will be mostly read from online platforms hosted by libraries or elsewhere. They will be read on handheld devices, that they will be mostly read in pieces from big blended databases of material where they're found by search, and that readers will still prefer paper for books that they care about while relying on these other forms for certain functions. That uncertainty makes it hard for presses to plan. It makes it hard to, advise, to offer advice to scholars who might be thinking about the form in which they will publish work currently in progress that may only be appearing in five years. It's kind of heady to think, hey, all these possibilities are equally likely, cool, but only if one has nothing at stake. I'd like to explore these uh, plausible futures a little more deeply. At Duke University Press, we sell most of our books in electronic versions for Nook or Kindle. We have an electronic package of our books that we sell to libraries. The books are available on Google Bookstore, and the iBookstore is not that far off. For all of that, by far most of the revenue comes from the physical books. Besides books, we publish about 45 journals. The journal staff consider the electronic form of the journal its primary form. That's a model of a plausible future for books as well. 10 or 15 years ago, scholars, uh, many of us in this room, subscribed to public culture or screen or signs if they wanted to read it. Now the number of individual subscribers to most journals is minuscule. If a scholar wants to read a journal article, she or he expects to be able to access it online through the library. I've caught myself looking at an article on the web rather than getting up and walking across my office to see the physical issue of the journal happily resting on my bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> that means almost all the costs of the journals are borne by libraries rather than shared, as in the past, by libraries and individual subscribers. Many publishers, including Duke, sell their journals in packages, either their own collection or through Muse or other aggregations. The commercial versions of this practice from science publishers, such as Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley, have sucked millions and millions of dollars from academic libraries. That's where the library budget crisis comes from. That aside, the package model means a library might end up holding a journal it might otherwise not purchase on a case-by-case -case basis. What if books were sold the same way and we just expected them to be available online? It would increase the difference between rich and poor institutions and between those who had access to university libraries and those who didn't. Right now, interested readers, and the brilliant social media researcher Dana Boyd comes to mind, who are not associated with universities, have no access to most journal articles. What would happen to books that aspire to reach non-academic audiences, whether Jasper Puar's terrorist assemblages or UC Press's History of Zinfandel? The latter might be an easy call for needing to be available in a traditional book or Kindle version, but what about the former? Would we have known that it would have such wide impact ahead of time? On the other hand, if libraries bought most of the books and hosted them with site licenses, a lot more things would be plausible. Libraries buying a site license to all the Duke books or all the ones from Stanford or whoever would be paying for the collection. In that light, a book by Ai Wang counts the same as a first-time author's book on Silver Age Spanish drama. I wouldn't have to worry about whether a book would be great and sell to sign it up for a list, just that it'd be great and keep the, up the Duke brand so libraries kept up their subscriptions. Certainly, as mentioned earlier, there would be no reason to hold the book at any given length, especially if it turns out most users are searching across a group of books. Let's take this further. My journals colleagues would like to see all our books and journal material available across one platform. If you're looking for work by Lauren Berlant, how important to you is it whether it appeared in one of her books or in a collection of essays, or in a journal article? What if everything was available in pieces? We could search through books and journals like we search in iTunes, moving mid-search from artist to songs, making our own playlist. R right now, 
All those pieces of academic writing are written in a different way, with different genre rules. What happens if this form of reading becomes dominant? Would we tell our students to make sure that each chapter of their book repeats the background and main argument, the setup that we would now expect to find in an introduction, so that each fragment makes sense? I'm sure by now you can see the range of issues. Some of these changes are happening very quickly. Uh, Project Muse and JSTOR and the collection formerly known as Oxford Scholarship Online, now University Scholarship Online, have been working incredibly hard in the last three months to try and sign up every university press to brand new ebook collections. No one knows how they'll work, how presses or authors will receive compensation, or whether libraries strapped for funds will even buy them. Will these take hold? Or will they become this year's every book should be an app instead? How's your CD-ROM library holding up? <laughs> University presses are in a position where they have to invest in each of the plausible options I've described, while most of the revenue that supports them still comes from the printed books. Like the scholar who has to write to fit a form as yet unknown, presses have to plan as if all or most of these forms will take hold without knowing the outcome. Thus the challenge and opportunity of writing and publishing in the present moment. So here's one way to ease the uncertainty. Uh, pause. I'll remind you of what you already know. Academic institutions are slow to change for good <laughs> and bad. Even within academic institutions, changes to the criteria for hiring, tenure, and promotion are glacial. On those grounds, it's a pretty safe bet that academic books will continue to count for promotion. The most recognizable form, here's my book tenure committee, will carry the most weight precisely because it requires the least explanation. I'm confident that born digital long form projects will count too, but in most places and in the near term, that's likely to require a peer-to-peer -peer education process. <laughs> it will also require precedent. We meet with Duke li librarians once a semester, and I asked them earlier this week if they'd been asked to acquire such a project, not a database, but an argument in born digital form. They said no. If each of you who can vote on tenure tries to imagine what you would vote to count as the equivalent of a book, even if you support the concept, it's still pretty hard to do. So it's going to be a while before a faculty member can tell a new hire, don't worry about the book, just keep on working on your digital project. I don't necessarily think that's good or bad, it's just tenure. The situation will not be dissimilar with university presses. Most presses break even at best. Most are supported with subsidy from their institution. That's not what you would say makes the optimal R&D scenario, whereas they say, to learn you have to be prepared to fail. A year ago, many trade presses thought that an app-based book would be the hottest thing by this year. They could invest the capital and see what happened. A university press mostly can't. I can think a teach yourself Lacan game would be a big hit, <laughs> but I can't go out and pay someone to develop one. However, if anyone would like to uh, <laughs> develop that in their spare time, please feel free to come talk to me. I, th I actually think it would be great if you had like boss level, I've achieved boss level Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> so presses will continue to look to find their way in the current landscape for some time. And that's good and bad, but it means a slower change process for the genre of the book. That doesn't mean no change in what is publishable, just that the change is of a more familiar kind. The cutbacks in funding for education, public and private, including the devastating underfunding that is uh, having the effect on all of you, ruining the UC and Cal State systems, has huge effects on presses. I hear from scholars at places like SF State who could no longer afford to attend conferences in their field, underpaid adjuncts, unfunded grad students, and faculty who have lost research funds are all going to buy fewer books, in addition to hurting in all the other ways. The same cutbacks have driven libraries at even comparatively well-off private institutions to move to something called patron-driven acquisitions. 
It's the perfect neoliberal term. It sounds like you have more freedom. It's patron driven. I have choice. But it really means the libraries won't buy books until a certain number of patrons request them. So instead of building a collection in a given area on the assumption that maybe we don't have somebody who does South Asian photography now, but when that person comes, they will expect that the books will be here, it post the library postpones or avoids most purchases. Great. Uh, that puts more pressure on which books presses can publish. At Duke, there are always some books that we publish that win prizes, get great reviews, and become important in their field or interdisciplinary niche, but don't take off in sales terms. I'm sure we're not unique in that, in that way. Uh, without the library sales, a whole set of these books move from what we think of as a valuable contribution, if only marginally publishable. They just kind of drop down a level to like, oops, I guess I shouldn't have signed that up. That means more concrete thinking about the disciplinary differences in who teaches the books that they write, on the quality of the writing itself rather than just the quality of the thought, on making a viable list under increasingly narrow circumstances. Perhaps that's why my thinking has turned so much to genre at this juncture. The questions of what makes a book work now and what might make it work in the future. It's why the quandary isn't merely academic. The scholarship that, and the need to publish is too crucial. It's the commitment to the possible futures of your work that makes this closer attention to the possible form and genres all the more necessary. Yeah. We'll take questions. Which could be about anything, including things I didn't, I failed to address. So, yeah. so uh, Shane Butler, UCLA. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned the way in which some of the seemingly minor, now seemingly minor transformations of the book of 50, 100 years ago look ridiculous to debates about what would happen mm -hmm. in, the, in light of our upheavals, tectonic mm -hmm. changes in the book. Um, but of course, we don't really have that perspective on our own moment. We mm -hmm. suspect that it's enormous. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of ways in which it seems incontrovertible that it's right. enormous. It's probably fair to say that it's as big as the transition from rural to codex or the transition from manuscript to print. Mm -hmm. But even when you look back on those, you're struck not only by changes, and there certainly were changes, but also by continuities. Right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I work on one, for example, the page, the page that persists from antiquity and roll through to cyberspace. It right. doesn't seem very willing to go away. And I was really struck by all the ways in which you talked about the book and analogous scholarly products in terms of something that, you know, whether or not it's bound is bounded. You know, the book right. is an aggregate. The book mm -hmm. is something that has an edge and mm -hmm. beyond it, it's not the book anymore. Lots of things can bind it. It can be bound materially. It can be bound by the name of its creator. It can be bound by an argument, as mm -hmm. you say, rhetorically. Do you think that's going to go away, or is that showing really strong resilience during these transformations? Obviously, it is. it piggybacks on the conservatism of, for example, academic economies, but it seems to have legs even beyond that. So is it, is it stable, or is it, in fact, uh, precarious? I don't know. I, I hold that in question because I realize that my, the governing assumption here is that we will still want scholars to produce a long-form argument. And it's like, why, why am I so certain of that? It's not that there haven't been other changes in what counted as good scholarship. And the people who thought a good book on Faulkner was to document all the uses of different species of trees in different Faulkner novels were doing something that was considered good scholarship at the time. So it could just be that what we count as worthwhile scholarship will also change. So that's, that's a little different than the, the boundedness. But when you look at, I just saw Alex Juhas was here yesterday explaining her um, project in Scalar, which is a thing being developed by the Vectors folks at USC. So they're trying to do very long form, something like an argument. Nick Mirzov's done one. Uh, Alex's is still like the kind of prequel version, but the idea is of basically that you'll have a, some text and some visual material which might be housed in an archive. Uh, I think there's some that will come with the Shoah Institute in LA. 
I'm going to do some with uh, Deanna Taylor's Hemispheric Institute in NYU. And so material might be housed there to get around IP issues, intellectual property issues. Uh, and, but each frame would have some visual material and some written material. And you could either scale it so the visual was primary and the written was like a caption, or that the written was most of it and the visual was like an illustration. And then they'd be linked kind of like um, a child's toy where you have these different units and there'd be a kind of path through it that the author had intended, but then it would be equally readable by going out and going through in different ways. And the dream of this is that it would be eventually something as easy to use as WordPress or something so that you could just take these things and put it in. And that was part of my like Joe Aristotle joke, which was to, uh, ask whether that then produces something that, is it like a tour? Is it like an argument that kind of uh, accumulates in a different way, sort of like um, Katie Stewart's Ordinary Affects that we published, where you read through it and, and you kind of, the argument sort of seeps up into you uh, without like coming at you and saying, in this book I argue that. Um, so I, that's a, that's a it's a really good question. And scalar is sonic as well. You have order. <coughs> right. As well. Uh, Stefan I guess as a historian, when I'm when I'm faced, you know, by the by the future that increasingly what we as scholars produce will be mainly available electronically. What makes me nervous is how do we know how we store this electronically now? We can still read in 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years. If you publish books, even if some libraries burn, one book survives somewhere. So, right. so I just think it's a certain amount of hubris that we believe that these technologies will endure not mm -hmm. just five, 10 years, but hundreds, hundreds of years. I don't know what I mean. Right. No, that was my earlier position, which I'm trying to get away from. Uh, <laughs> I was once on a, a Born Digital dissertation committee uh, came to talk to at, also at USC, and they were trying to argue for Born Digital dissertations. And I was like, well, how do we know that this will be readable in the future? Like, you know, there's stuff about how Stanford has lost a lot of its detailed financial records from the 80s because they were put in electronic form and they can now see the summaries but not the detail. And I was like, somebody's dissertation, you have people going back and doing work on uh, Park students in Chicago and the studies that they did where you can go and see all the dissertations in the library and you read them and you say, oh, nobody paid attention to, they were going out and looking at these kind of Chicago residents who would have thought that what's going to be the equivalent in 100 years. And so that kind of confidence about it, uh, uh, I share that word. Yeah. I've become totally self-conscious about pointing the time. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, evidence of a successful day. <laughs> just, <laughs> just lead with your own. Starting from UC Berkeley, and, and the question follows more or less on from the end of your answer to Shane. Um, and, and that is to say that when I'm in conversation with advocates for the digital humanities, uh, one of the things I hear consistently is that these offer new possibilities, new openings. They're not just, a, they're not just ways of accommodating to a new medium the same kinds of things we were doing, but there's a driving force. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, uh, and you started to say some things about that, but I wonder to what extent university presses are thinking of these new media as opening new kinds of possibilities rather than simply responding to a set of constraints or problems. I think they, they're, um, they do both, but the amount of challenges, and that's why I thought you couldn't tell the story without talking about like, how do you pay for this? So often, for instance, this is a different version of the last question, which is like uh, people say, oh, if it's not being printed, the press is spending less money, which only, which anticipates something that will never, never have to be updated and kept, kept moving forward. So I think the, in terms of are there new possibilities? Yes. Do they have concrete challenges? Yes. 
Do they necessarily bring in new audiences? In some ways, you can certainly see uh, the Haystack uh, scholars who are all grad students and are having dialogue blogs with uh, different scholars have 300,000 unique hits. I, I don't have a book with 300,000 readers. Uh, so, you know, the, in that sense, you could be reaching different audiences. Is there some way that that turns into something that helps support, like, the basic reasons for scholarly publishing? Like, could you, is that, if you post it, people will hit it? Or is it, will visit it? Or is it something that is some, is it, if it's still important to sell things, if there's not some other way of supporting the function of publication, does it lead to that? I'm a little, the long tail is seeming a little less like the kind of magic solution than it once did. Um, but certainly in terms of could you have music, could you have video, could you have something that was, had more kind of three-dimensional, you know, what if last night David told us about his uh, trip to uh, Lebanon and uh, as visual as the description was, you know, if somebody were going around with the video camera and showing us the places, wouldn't that make a better public culture article? Wouldn't it make a better uh, chapter in a book? Absolutely. So, you know, if it's just weighing those things out and then how you get there and where, and so this goes back to vectors, and part of what I'm interested in in terms of these kind of conventions, one of the trouble with vectors, people have always said, is it's not a journal of anything. It's a journal where you get to see a whole bunch of really smart people doing experiments with smart designers. So what makes you remember to go and read the journal the same way if you're a film scholar, you remember you have to look at screen, or if you're an Americanist, you remember you have to look at American Quarterly. And so what are the versions of this that kind of take hold in, different, in a place where they become part of like the more regular scholarly routines and things that people build on? But we have a different response to that if we say, we understand vectors to be a kind of organized experimental space. Yeah. And That's good. Can I just interject? Yeah. I wonder if there's not something about the Haystack Scholars example, where you get three, 300,000 hits, uh, which speaks to the more sort of agentive, the more mm -hmm. agency-driven um, engagement than the more passive, consumptive engagement right. of reading a book. And if one thinks of production that produces them, right, uh, you, you might have a different mode of proceeding. I want to take Shane's question, Susan Amy said, mm -hmm. said, I want to take Shane's question and flip it, which is how different is the, the dipping in method of reading that becomes what you do when you follow hits on the web, when you're doing searches on the web and you're looking at little portions, from the kind of reading that many of us do lots of the time. I mean, mm -hmm. there are books that we engage with as books. Mm -hmm. And then I would th expect that for most of us, there are things that we go into, we are books we go to and we look at the index because we're looking for one specific thing that we're trying to figure out mm -hmm. and we're going to the index for that thing and we look at that page and I may go back a page or two and I may go forward a page or two, but we actually read that way already. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why I use the mystery example. Yeah. We don't tell people, oh, just write the introduction and write the conclusion, and in the middle, just put those Latin, fake Latin pages, because okay. nobody's going to read that part. <laughs> <laughs> we still tell people to write it as if, so that the person who's having the full reading experience gets the best experience, and that governs the way the book is done, so that it's true that the actual practice of reading is really different. And, you know, I own tons of books where I got to page 38 and then never went back. There are things where people just pick them up, read in the middle. There are things people find through the index. Most of the books that are online and Google anyway, you can go and search for some term and find the search. I think that what I was thinking more about would be what would become, what would you advise somebody to do? You know, you have a student, they're finishing, they want to publish their book. What sort of advice do you give them, which is really different than what are all the possible ways of doing it, in the same way that 
you know, you could have a YouTube video. Some people would watch the whole thing. Some people click over, go nah, and cl and click back, and you'll do all kinds of different things. So I think that consumption side is always going to be very, very, very. I agree. Um, the backlist so far, I would say, uh, you know, the whole time I put, we, when I got to the press, the backlist was very minuscule part of what we did because of the long but undistinguished history of the press. Uh, and uh, because the person who had been there in the 80s reviving it had done things that were, would sell right away rather than backlist. So the whole trend while I've been there is for backlist to be more and more of the sales. And that's continued, uh, so that's one measure. But it's hard to tell because if libraries and I think there's actually a lot of lag in scholars finding out books are out even in their own field. Uh, that one of the functions of the bookstore as public sphere space was you go in and you go, oh, so and so, Beth Pavanelli's book is out. I was waiting for that. Oh, great. Whereas if you have to wait for someone to post about it on Facebook or cite it somewhere else or you're going to run into it through some social media thing, there's a kind of longer thing. So the backlist, frontlist percentage might reflect a slower take up of, of frontlist. But the backlist has held up. And when you look at individual titles, uh, Jameson's Postmodernism, Susan Stewart Online, that have been selling for like 20 years and are presumably mostly adoption things, the amount of stuff, the amount of sales year to year holds pretty steady. So that's at least made me think, you know, we don't have any, um, <clears throat> other than the readers, we don't have as much stuff as there was in Princeton that's like, this is really adoption, you know, big 300 person undergrad adoption kind of things like the sources of, 
uh, Asian religion things or something. Uh, so it's a little hard for me to say, but so far that seems okay. Um, I had a really interesting talk when I was at Riverside uh, with a friend who teaches in the system who was like, oh, I, I feel really great. I didn't have to assign any books this term because uh, all the books are already in the UC libraries online. So I just told all the students to use that. I was teaching Jaspier's book. I was like, well, you know, Jaspier doesn't get any royalties if you just use the book that way. And the press doesn't get really very much money from the library having gotten the site license for this book. And the person who was a pretty ethical person was like, oh, well, next time I'll be sure to order it. But so I think that's more of what something I said that and Napsterization are the two things I worry about with, with the backlist. I'm, I'm not convinced that the electronic thing will hold on either. I don't use a Kindle to read. There are people who I know who really like it and who read um, academic things and who take stuff, you know, they're traveling and it's the easiest way to like carry a bunch of stuff with them. An aging academic population with an increasing percentage of bad backs. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, uh, perhaps, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't at all seem to me a given that things won't come back around. If you assume that this kind, you know, the two things, I guess what I was trying to do in the talk is to bring the materiality and what the genre expectations were back together again in a way that perhaps we hadn't so much. And so I think how those two things go, you know, if, if people say, no, an ethnography really, it's too short to try and do it, you know, Arjuna Potter, I can write 125 pages and call that his new book, but you can't for your first book, that has to be like a 250 or a 350 page book, then maybe people decide, no, that's not what I want to read on an iPad, maybe that's not what I, so the, the Academy could kind of force that to happen by, claim, by pushing on the form, or you could end up with something that's like, oh, this is really just text. This would benefit from having uh, sense around and uh, odorama and a lot of digital accompaniments so that uh, people would actually get something more out of a digital environment. So you've been doing this work there. Is there uh, at Google, is there a kind of optimism that this will be, become the dominant thing? You know, they've been uh, trying to I'm sell them. I work with absolutely it's an electronic teacher. Yeah. But you'll read electronically. It's just not, they're all working on the transition. Mm -hmm. This is the transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, article thing. Well, we're running out of time, so I'm going to run a bunch of questions together. Yeah. Um, so, Karen, Susan, Ted. Ted Porter, and Catherine. Lou, can you keep it short so that Ken has the last word? Me? Well, okay, the original thing I wanted to say is now long in the past. I think um, maybe I'll just make a, a, try and make a quick comment, and that is this uh, potential content provider uh, to uh, university presses that are trying to weather this transition that you sketched out, and it's a little problematic. Um, it seems that there's a chicken egg problem because some, some of us really want to provide foreign digital projects, but the presses are, you know, um, actually not yet in the receiving mode because they're trying to um, hold on to and provide materials that the majority of people seem to still want, want to um, buy uh, and to use, um, um, including the people who are providing those other formats. Um, uh, uh, and and um, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a part of the transitional moment is that actually um, we aren't able to uh, fully realize the possibilities that might make it more interesting than just a pasted up uh, uh, text um, on, a, on a new video. Just for that. Carol. Carol. Yeah. <laughs> is, is Duke trying to also embrace electronic tools to do more like author promotion? So we talked about the book, but people often. Do you follow me on Twitter? <laughs> yes. So, does it seem like that? Yes, but for you, but what about, I guess my question is, a lot of times... Do you follow the press? People don't start <laughs> with a book. They start with picking up somebody's blog entry. They start with picking up an mm -hmm. op-ed. They start with picking up your name, mm -hmm. your content.
concept, your piece that's somewhere out moving, mm -hmm. is, is to try to capture that in Quite a, quite a huge amount, and the university is supportive, and I think our publicist has kind of bloomed with it. Um, oh, I'm waiting. Sorry, go ahead. Please, I'll tell you. I just wanted to continue briefly on the theme of how people were reading already. I happen to have, uh, you know, reading through these old German uh, journals that I'm looking at, looking at now, and sometime in the 1870s or 1880s, you see, I saw at least where I was reading these uh, vast compilations of little bibliographic entries with enough description, you know, to, uh, so you know the you know the main thing, and we, you know, we um, uh, or so that is say there are there are many ways there are many technologies of dipping in or of learning a little bit going all along, and we uh, you know I was taught to graduate students and still teach our graduate students you know sometimes you know how to uh, how to uh, spend an hour with a book or you know that's say any length of time you know <laughs> five minutes and half an hour an hour whatever and to you know get the get the gist of the thing, and in some ways. I think this is part of Mary's point. It's actually the technologies actually make that less. I mean, the technologies are very good if you if the old, if what you want to find out is whether you're psychic. <laughs> <laughs> you can search your name and you're done. But uh, if you uh, you know, but you know, actually you're kind of getting a sense of the footnotes or you know all the different ways you might dip into a book. And actually, it's harder to uh, flip the pages. And uh, you know, the tech, I don't know whether the technology will do that, but it's not obvious that the match that the you know that the uh, uh, the, the, the technologies are better suited to our more casual reading styles, or even that the reading styles are in every way becoming, you know, more casual or more, you know, uh, you know, uh, resistant to the, you know, the straight through reading, which doesn't happen that much with academic books, I think. Okay. I just think about um, the knowledge, but positive, optimistic observations, because I just finished answering, answering copy edit queries for manuscript, and it was much facilitated by digitization yeah. of uh, publication. So I got what I think would have taken me three months, actually took me three weeks, or maybe, because I have to do it in between teaching and everything else. So, um, because the Jameson is online and I don't memorize it, I haven't memorized it you know, page by page, <laughs> I, I, am, I have footnote queries, I can search for terms and I'll find it. So in a very conservative, scholarly way, this has actually helped me get to print publication. But the other thing I was thinking of, well, we've talked a lot about dipping in, but I'd like to talk about rereading. And I have to tell you that there is nothing like rereading something. Maybe it's because my memory is fading, but um, I'm rereading stuff all the time, and I find that the texture and the warp and the woof of a book that I've read once, reread again, uh, which Kindle doesn't provide me with, um, you know, enriches the second reading. In fact, more and more I find it's the second reading that really provides me with the um, working through. So we've talked about all these forms of dipping in, but rereading actually really helps. And one, at one time, when I was younger, I probably could have remembered more references, but because digitization has taken that place, it's helped me enormously um, with patience with rereading, but also speed of um, citation. So it's not a question necessarily, but it is a positive aspect of the digitization of books. Yeah. So, I, yeah, this is all very helpful. I would say, Karen, that probably if you went back and asked people six months ago how receptive they were and asked them now, you would get different answers and you would get different answers six months from now. Part of the question is actually about is the press doing something that's going to be given away? Like, oh, here's this melon funded project. Will you publish it? Well, what are we going to get? Nothing. Just like, here's some support funds versus something that somebody knows how it's going to happen. Um, but I, and in terms of the marketing things, I think the electronic things have become, in a way, almost overly central because they're taking the place for the pushing out from the public sphere of other kinds of print media. And so whole books are made through connections with blogs and other stuff that we've done. Um, but you see the same kind of thing where something can get a lot of publicity and not sell at all the same way it could get a great review or a set of great reviews or win a prize and not sell at all. So there's that same kind of, there's not like some magic thing. And I was actually trying to present a more upbeat thing, so I, I, uh, sorry if it ended up seeming uh, down, downward, uh, but I think the kind of heterogeneity is actually what we're going to be swimming in for a period of time, and I really just want to open out some bigger questions so that 
as we're thinking about directions for scholarship, that we kind of keep at least an ear to the, what the possible forms in which that scholarship might be circulated. So. Well, thank you for a wonderfully generous talk.